Hello, everyone, and welcome to Intimacy with the World podcast. I am Dorita Holm, your host on this show, where we explore what it really means to be human and what really matters to be able to live a meaningful life. So today I'm speaking with Jenny Graham from Inverness in Scotland. And Jenny Graham, she holds the Guinness record, the Guinness world record for being the fastest woman to circumnavigate the planet by bike, covering just about 30,000 kilometers solo and unsupported in 124 days, 11 hours. Now, with a passion for mountains, she has dedicated seven years to the Scottish Mountain Rescue Service. She has traveled the world riding in grassroots bikepacking events and routes such as the Arizona Trail, the Highland Trail, and the Trans-Pyrenees, and more. And Jenny is also a director at the Adventure Syndicate. That's a collective of female endurance athletes whose deep-rooted ethos is in helping others question and realize their own potential. She has toured the UK with her Round the World Tales. She has produced a podcast series and co-produced her film Eastbound about riding on her bike around the world. Uh, Jenny is currently presenting for the GCN's documentary channel. That's the Global Cycling Network channel. And she is currently writing her first book. And last but not least, Jenny is Lachlan's mother. <laughs> so welcome to Intimacy with the World podcast, Jenny. <laughs> oh, that is lovely. What a lovely introduction, Zarita. <laughs> well, and, it's, uh, yeah. it's who you are, right? <laughs> yeah, it's funny, isn't it, when you hear all these things getting listed and you're like, oh yeah, yep, yeah, we did do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So as far as I understand, Jenny, on the surface, you were a pretty normal girl growing up in Inverness. Is that right? Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, from the Highlands of Scotland in Inverness. And we didn't, you know, that was um, just like working class estate, working class council estate. And there just, just wasn't sort of, my eyes weren't open to the outdoor world. Like, 30 years ago, so I'm 40 now, so when I was growing up there, like 30 odd years ago, if you were, you know, knocking about in your Lycra and skinny bike tires, you'd be <laughs> going, this is an absolute weirdo, like, you know, people would point at people that had canoes on their roof and stuff like that, so the, uh, although we were always outside playing and building dens and, you know, messing about, and we always had bikes to, you know, to get, to get around on, but there was no, there was no outdoor sports as such in, in, uh, that I was aware of in the Highlands at that time. Yeah. So it, yeah, I wasn't like, I was well into my twenties by the time I sort of discovered this whole new world. And, and, and so then I gathered that you did mountain biking around Inverness, which is in the middle of the Highlands in Scotland. So it's, it's, it's perfect for, for outdoors life, even if you started late, but how, did this apparently normal girl from Inverness turn into the woman who decided I am going to be the fastest woman to ride around the world on a bike? How, how did that come around? Do you know, it's, I know it sounds like a massive jump, but actually it felt like a completely natural progression for me. Do you know, I just felt like I was on this journey um, for like 15 years. So when I w was introduced to the outdoors and I very first started sort of biking and, and getting into the hills and um, Lachlan was young, like Lachlan's 22 now, but he would have just been starting school. And I guess his journey, growing up, going through school, becoming more independent, then leaving school and you know all this like had a massive effect on my connection with the outdoors so I would use the outdoors when Lachlan was you know I, I'd split up from his dad and I would use the outdoors when Lachlan was away with his dad as something to sort of soothe me you know because like when your kid's away and you're young you're you, you feel like you've almost lost your sense of purpose so I'd often use that time um to to go into the outdoors and sort of build up these these adventures 
and I continued doing that so then you know Lachlan was grown older and you become more independent don't you like as it, he becomes more independent you become redundant all of a sudden you're like it's like you're a goalie for this teenager that only needs you sometimes when things are about to get really bad but most of the time they want you to stay away um, and so yeah so that sort of it, it, having time in my life and realizing actually there's nothing I want to do more than like and discover <clears throat> excuse me discover new places and discover myself like discover my mind and discover my capabilities and it was a it was a gradual step-by-step -step process but nonetheless uh, you know a journey that I was that I was on for for that whole time uh, um and uh, you you wrote completely unsupported. What does that actually mean? I mean, what was your what did you have with you? What does it mean that you're writing unsupported? So unsupported, just it, it, unsupported and solo. So I carried everything on my bike that I might need to fix my bike, to fix myself to sleep at night, uh, to eat, like extra clothes. There was no support there. I had no van with a mechanic in it or a bed at night or somebody, you know, paving the way and checking that the roads were okay. You're just out there, like looking, just looking after yourself as well as, as well as riding. And that for me was a key part because I think, um, of course, you can ride a lot more miles and a lot faster if you've got somebody looking after you and you've got, you know, somebody looking after the logistics. But actually, that part of looking after yourself and pushing yourself physically and really looking after yourself mentally is, yeah, it fascinates me. Uh, so what turned out to, to be actually the biggest fear once you were on the road? Because as far as I've understood, I mean, very often you actually slept by the side of the road in your sleeping bag. Isn't it, I mean, in, in, in parts of the world, all over the world, I mean, in Russia, in, in China, in uh, you name it, all over the world. Uh, what was the biggest fear? Were you not afraid? Yeah, so um, I had a yeah, waterproof sleeping bag to, to, like you say, just to sleep at the side of the road. And after 15 hours a day on your bike, you just crawl into a ditch or into a pipe under the road and you're like, this will do fine. Um, and then I did get accommodation some nights as well. Um, but it wasn't really the sleeping out. I think all the components to ride around the world I had built up so it, although it sounded extreme I was used to living on my bike for a few weeks at a time you know going minimalistic I was used to traveling through countries that I couldn't speak the language I was used to um, camping out and um, like staying in wild in wild sort of places so all these things although it was like a massive journey I'd sort of built up the skill set at home so that finding somewhere to sleep wasn't a major issue although funnily enough every single continent you went on to they had different sort of rules it took you it took you a couple of days to get into the way of life there you know because you were like oh what's the new things I've got to worry about what are people going to be okay with how is people's mentality you know if they're getting woken up at two in the morning with me at, on a on a hostel door trying to get a bed um so that yeah that stuff was that stuff was always developing but I mean I think it was the traffic ultimately that I was scared of I mean the traffic going over Russia was just insane and um, yeah the people were amazing when they weren't behind a steering wheel and it's the same worldwide isn't it these people are gorgeous they want to look after you they want to make sure you know you've got enough food and water and do you need somewhere to stay but yet they get they get in their vehicle and behind that wheel and all of a sudden you're now the least important person in the world you know yeah so, well, like when they can't see your eyes and they can't see you as the person person they're just seeing you as a nuisance for them to speed along, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. As yeah. you know, because you've been out here in Spain riding, that here in the south of Spain where I live, the, the, the drivers are very respectful of, of cyclists. But that's not the, the norm, is it? Yeah, no, it's not. Yeah, Spain yeah. is great, isn't yeah. it? And you did, um, I mean, there was the majority 
of places that I went, you know, unless you were traveling through big cities, the, then the traffic was really manageable and you, you could tell, you know, when the busy times were going to be. But it's just particular sections in Russia. I've never been so scared in my whole life. <laughs> yeah, I, I gathered that you started riding during the night and sleeping during the day to, to get away from the traffic. Is that right? In Russia? Exactly. Yeah, exactly that. So it was just, um, just turned my night into day for, I had 1200 miles to cover um, to get out of the really busy section. And I was covering about, um, I was covering say 200 a day at that point. So I knew I had sort of five, five days or so to um to sort of get out of the busy bit and I thought I can I can ride through the night for five days and just deal with the body clock thing at the <laughs> end of it. <laughs> it it takes it takes some mindset I mean just just getting a feel of what you've been through you know sleeping in ditches and in pipes that run under the road and dealing with traffic and re- dealing with people in different cultures it takes a, a mindset to deal with that uncertainty, that level of uncertainty. And, and I would say fear, there must have been fear sometimes. Mm. Yeah, I think there was, especially towards the end, there was fear. And that was probably because I was so tired that I couldn't, like I couldn't rationalize things anymore. So when I r- arrived in Alaska and there was bears now to worry about, like grizzly bears to on these big empty roads. And I was so exhausted. Like I remember feeling like I am never going to be okay ever again. I'm so, so tired. And, and, and so then the bear fear, like I was imagining bears like sneaking up behind me and like just grabbing me, you know, like not bear sort of behavior at all. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it was just like constantly like stressing about this. So I definitely noticed, um, I noticed getting worn down with the, with that sort of worries towards the end. Um, but yeah, it's that resilience, isn't it? I had to keep sort of reminding myself and you know a friend reminded me when I was out there and and something had happened and I was like oh I messaged her I was like oh I have to turn back this is so annoying and she's like you know you know it's the riding is the fun part it's like lots of people can do the riding it's dealing with the things that go wrong and that's your skill set remember that and I was like yes like that's where the resilience comes in it's not getting on your bike day after day it's when things aren't going your way not losing it and and feeling like you're going to quit or like it's too big a big an, a, an issue you know he- hearing you speak like that it gives me goosebumps because I think it's so interesting what you say about that lots of people can actually ride the kilometers you know to be actually be able to ride 30,000 kilometers in 124 days there will be lots of cyclists who can do that and that that's not where the difference lies the difference is 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 your mind right so yeah. how come you have that kind of mind Jenny how come you are the fastest woman to ride unsupported around the world what, what is it that you have that I mean I mean I have to there there is a mindset for sure and there's also you know there's also a string of opportunities that you've been able to say yes to and so like I found myself with a year a year out having this crazy idea being really worried about saying it out loud because it was such a big jump for other people to see you know to to get their heads around that I've just been over to Arizona first time in America by myself and now I'm going to cycle around the world next year and so you know I am um, I, I, it was hard to sort of say it out loud and take other people's sort of um opinion and criticism and worries on but the I, I, I guess I had faith that I knew that I could physically do it but it was just that believing that you know the thing I really struggled with is like believing that I was that person that I deserved a place on the start line I didn't worry that I could do it because I was like well I'm doing it like I'm training like mad and I'm riding these hour, eight hours and I know I've got the the head for it I know I love I love looking after myself in the hills like that. I love it when the going gets tough. I love being, you know, if I've like, I don't want to be stuck in a big storm, but if a big storm comes in and then you have to problem solve around it, I get like, I get a buzz from that stuff. 
I don't find it I don't think of that as being really hard I think of that as being actually quite enjoyable now I know that's that's strange but I think that's the that's the difference people think I'm good at suffering when actually I'm not that good at suffering if I'm finding something really hard I'm I'm the same as everybody else you know at that uh, but it's the difference is that I don't that the mentality of that issue I don't find it I'm not going in saying this is really difficult I'm like yes how are we going to get out of this <laughs> <laughs> and I think I think that's the major difference it's not you know when I am um, yeah so when uh, when I'm actually suffering and hurting I have not got a massive tolerance for that I yeah that's so interesting it's like that, that the, the challenge brings you alive no it's like it's invigorating to be in a challenge like how can I solve this right yeah yeah, yeah. and that you exactly. don't see it as suffering you see it as wow look what life is doing now how can I deal with this <laughs> I know exactly exactly and that you'd get into like really you know silly situations and be exhausted it's four in the morning and you're like huddled up in some t toilet block and this massive storm and you've not slept and you're hungry and you're like oh this is so hard and then you'd look in the mirror and see the state of yourself and you'd be like well of course it's hard you numpty if not everybody would be doing it <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly so, I mean, it was very hard. Uh, I mean, I, I've seen photos from your journey and, and I've heard you tell about in more, in more details all the things that happened, you know, and sleeping very little and pushing your body so hard. So, so would you take the same decision again to ride around the world like that? Would you do that again? You know, I, I so honestly, I don't think I would. I don't think I would and if I did I think it would be for my ego I think when you know records are made to be broken and another woman is going to go out there and and absolutely smash my record and I have to be okay with that that has to be okay but when you've poured your life and you know your whole life into something then it's um it's a process to begin to separate you the person Jenny Graham and the Guinness World Record you know it's like I am I can't be attached to that I am not that that person that doesn't you know that's not my identity it's just something that I did and it's just an, another part so um I think that if I was if I was driven to cycle around the world again the same way that I did then it would only be because I you know it hurt me that somebody else has got it and I think I could go and beat them and I don't I wouldn't want to do it for that because that's not the way I did it this time you know it was yeah I wanted to get the record and I was really focused but I was fascinated that I could be out there doing that like me like what <laughs> like I, you know it was just incredible that I, I was just amazing myself that I was that I could do it and it really um I, and to do it with a, a little bit of a harder focus like that against people and to be to, so you'll be still be okay with yourself I think isn't isn't me so I hope not what I would love to do is take my mountain bike and take like four years and ride around the world and <laughs> all the different mountain ranges with lots of friends and stopping off places and you know I definitely want to keep traveling by bike and I and I still want to take part in events that you ride fast but um, maybe not not the same one. I did mm. think about the Americas for a while. Yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. still not off the card. So something different and long distance, yeah, yeah. but not not going back for the same so, record. So you said that you wouldn't want to go and do that to break the ref record again and that you were there and you were marveling at yourself, like marveling at your own capability. So has it then changed how you look at yourself? I mean, was it in 2018 you broke the record? So yes, yeah, so it was two years ago. In, in 20, so it's about two years ago. So has it changed how you look at yourself, being able to do that? Yeah, I think I've got um, it, it, how I look at myself and how I look at the world. I mean, and this is the, this is the work that we're doing with um, the Adventure Syndicate. It's just, I just know that if I am able to get that off the ground, if I'm able to get to that start line, 
let alone the finish line, like just getting to that start line. And then, you know, then we're all, we've all got that capabilities and more within us. Now, I can't stress enough that although this was, you know, a good mindset and good physical ability, like the stars aligned for me to let this trip happen. You know, things were, when I started putting it out there and saying to people, then these incredible opportunities would come up and um, things sort of fell into place. Although, yes, it was really difficult to get the money together and it was really, you know, difficult to work it out. It's not that it was easy, but it was just that, some bits really flowed and I can imagine if you you know that th that wouldn't always happen I've been in situations that that didn't always happen so yeah I mean I think if you've got a good mindset and physically able there is a bit there is a bit of good luck that comes in there too isn't there yeah but that's quite interesting so so seeing how all the things were falling into place like you have the idea I want to do this and then all of a sudden things start falling into place that's my experience in life too when i have a yeah. more or less crazy idea that everything starts falling into place if, over a, a period of time that also does change your outlook on life no doesn't it give you more trust in life itself somehow yeah you're so right Janita. and i think um like i can imagine you well i know i've seen you <laughs> I've seen you, I've seen you putting things out into the world and making things happen. And you've, you've got this focus, like, well, of course this is going to happen. And, you know, um, and, and, and I guess that has a knock on effect to the people around you. They, they're like, well, she said this is going to happen. We better make this happen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's fascinating, isn't it? it is, but yeah, yeah. that, um, I think the, poss the possibilities you know, have, um, yeah, have really, have really opened, opened my eyes to that and not just for myself, but to others as well. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful that you want to empower others through the adventure syndicate to, to, to feel that same empowering, yeah. no, that you can do this. So I was wondering, uh, did you get to know some aspect of yourself that you didn't know before? That you didn't know was there you know because when you push yourself so hard you get a, you you see yourself you meet yourself you know for real yeah. <laughs> so was there, was there something that surprised you and i'm i was surprised at how well i coped of, of, of for um of being on my own for so long so you know i was a mum at 18 so I, you know, I'm still really young and I've been, I've, I've, and then I've been, I've been a mum my whole adult life. And so this was my first real time away by myself for four months without friends, family, like I'm quite sociable. Um, and I was like, I'm going to really struggle with this. And actually I loved it. <laughs> I was like, I couldn't think of, I wouldn't want anybody here with me you know I wish that um I wish that you know obviously people I cared about could come back and see these things with me on another trip but I didn't ever I wasn't like you know pining for other people to be there I absolutely loved my own company and I loved the freedom of um like flowing through your emotions you know, when you're out there, you know this, there's no hiding from your emotions. If you're angry, sad, like frustrated, like what are you feeling and why are you feeling it? And, there, and, and you don't have to, you know, there was none of this like toughen up and get that emotions away. I was like, what's wrong? You want to cry? Like almost dating myself to cry or like dating myself, you know, like just, just almost like um go on then giving myself permission you know go on then and and then thinking about it afterwards and it hit me how in society we just don't have that opportunity you know we're keeping it together for family for work for friends for you know all our lives are so so busy and actually getting to the bottom of you know of this roller coaster of, of emotions and allowing yourself that time and not berating yourself for, you know, not being at 100% all the time. It's liberating. Wow. It's, it's, I mean, you must be born wise, Jenny, because, you know, I, I've had to study for years psychology and mindfulness and meditation 
to get to the same insights <laughs> that you just have. Because what you're doing is what everybody that knows about these things actually recommends that you should do to have a healthy life, healthy emotional life, to actually dare to feel your feelings and to speak to your own feelings like, oh, you want to cry? Okay, let's cry. Like having this di dialogue where you're kind of, you're actually making a small distance between the core of yourself and your feelings. You're kind of observing yourself and it's not the end of the world if I cry. It's not the end of the world if I'm frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really good. I'm glad that's the thing to do because sometimes you can feel like, oh, here you are speak, speaking to your inside self again. <laughs> well, that's that's well, that's very wise thing to do, you know. <laughs> um, so I was just thinking, you know, because what you're doing at the Adventure Syndicate, you know, the ethos being to empower other women to see the possibilities and and to follow their dreams if, if they have a dream of doing something that norm that will often entail them going out of their comfort zone and uh having limiting beliefs but doing it anyway or working with lo those limiting beliefs uh how how do you work with limiting beliefs because uh, you must have them i mean now you're for example you're writing a book you've never written a book before that must be difficult also like okay am i going to write a book yeah <laughs> exactly oh yeah i have abs like so many limiting beliefs and just you know um when but i think here's the difference okay so i think for me is that th those limiting beliefs don't stop like that's that little voice inside you that you know if you're just not feeling like you know if you've just got any insecurity at all around that subject then it'll creep in you know when it's quiet or you're in your bed or you're just having a moment and things aren't going right and at any opportunity it'll come in there but what I've got better at is being is being able to rationalize that so it's there and then I'm you know I'm able to separate that is that true or am I running away with this with this thing here and if it is true and you know like writing is a great example so I am you know I'm not a natural writer like I really struggled in school I'm a bit dyslexic and I've got a lot of like emo emotional attachment around the stuff that I write you know in terms of self-doubt like berating the words that I'm putting out and always misspelling and getting really embarrassed about it and so actually writing a book you know I've sat out and I've got a writing space um, that I'm sort of getting to over winter because you know I've, I've managed to I've been like got all it's like getting all the gear all the gear and no idea I'm like right I've got the space to write in I've got the computer you know I've got all these like nice candles and music and I'm like oh now I've got to write I don't know what to say and uh, um, so yeah so I've sat for like four weeks with it so far and just like hardly got anything out on the on the page but it's been a process of of just dealing with that sort of anxiety about getting words out there and um and i've been yeah just sort of working working through that but i yeah i do you know before i went around the world i'm going off on a tangent but this is sort of relevant before i went around the world i thought about i thought that i was dreaming too big and that this was you know i i shouldn't be thinking like this almost um, and any time I thought about quitting quite a lot before I got to the start line, not after I started, after I started, I was on one, but before I got there, I thought about quitting a lot and I would, I would keep coming back to why do you want to quit? And I'd be like, cause I'm really frightened that I'm going to fail. I'm frightened that I'm not going to get to that start line. I'm frightened that I'm going to make a fool of myself. I'm frightened that, you know, um, even when I do get there, everything will fall apart and like I won't have the right visas, blah, blah, blah. Worry, 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 worry. And, and I'd be like, okay, so you want to quit because you're frightened. That's not good enough, Jenny Graham. And then I would just have that word and it's like, right, okay. So I think a long explanation is just that now I, I, give, I take myself, I get, I get myself removed from the situation and actually pull it apart a little bit. What's the feelings around it? What happens when you take your ego out of this situation? How do you feel about it now? 
not quite as daunting. <laughs> wow, Jenny, you are so wise. It's incredible to listen to you. It really is. As I said, it's, it's taking me so many years of hard study to get to the insights that you have. I love, I love what you said about, the, uh, you, said, you used the word process. You said something like um, that you realize that it's, it's a process working with limiting beliefs. And, it's, uh, and to me, it, it often becomes like a, a matter of trusting the process. Like, okay, so I don't really believe in it right now, but that's okay. I trust in the process that if I just keep, keep working one step and one step and one step, I will eventually get there. Like the trust in the process itself. That is such a good point. Yeah, you do have to trust the process because like the dream, the the dream project, you're from the start, you're a hundred percent like, yes, we've got this, let's go. But often, yeah, you're not. You're you're doubting yourself quite a lot. And but you have to put on this big smile and get everyone else on board. If not, it'll never happen. And the inside you're like, oh God, is this actually going to be okay? <laughs> Yeah. So I, I can't, I can't help uh, wondering, you know, when you're pushing yourself so hard, you're sleeping so little and pushing yourself so hard physically, but also mentally and in, uh, on a soul level, because you don't know the countries you're riding through, huge kangaroo, kangaroos in Australia that you think are going to attack you or grizzly bears in, in Canada and riding through big cities and having to sleep in the ditch and so on. Um, I can't, I can't help wondering, uh, was there ever any spiritual dimension, dimension to, uh, to being able to keep yourself uh, centered or, or sane? Mm. Do you think? It's funny, isn't it? I guess spiritual, it means it's something different to us all as well. Yes, I guess for sure. I feel things are quite spiritual when I feel connected to something much bigger than me and when I th this is an interesting one and when when I feel like what I'm doing is so insignificant in this world but yet it's the only thing that I am doing it's like my number one focus but I know that I am tiny and this is insignificant and there's something way bigger all around me but yet but yeah, I still feel comforted in that. You know, it's not like that's insignificant, don't do it. It's like, in the grand scheme of things, this is insignificant. But to you right now, right here, then this is the most important thing in your, in your world. Um, but just being able to like step back from that, um, oh, I'm cycling around the world, I'm trying to get the record. And you know, there was moments, especially like I was really connected to the moon out there. And I think it was my constant when I was on the road, you know, I had four full moons and just like every evening I rode a lot at night, like on, on every continent. And, you know, even when it was a really rubbish day, often the, you know, that you would just have a great night, a big moon, loads of stars, Milky Way. And I would just stop in my tracks and just be with that moon. And I kept leaving voice messages for friends and stuff and I'd be like just you know just can't explain how I feel right now it's just this moon is like bringing me alive and it's just giving me so much energy and I'm with it on its cycle and I'm on my cycle and um and it gave me real perspective you know no matter what is going on that moon is just going to carry on on its cycle de -de -de, bit by bit and then up again and then down again and it's you know it's like the waves coming in and out in and out and it's just really resonated with me just one pedal stroke at a time Jen one pedal stroke at a time wow just, yeah I, so I guess that. that's that is so beautiful and it's also like connecting very deeply to nature I hear I mean the moon is part of nature right yeah yeah oh, yeah big time and I think when you connect to nature it gives you that um, perspective you know if you're if I was finding if I was being too hard on myself on the ride about you know not meeting targets or not going fast enough or whatever you know whatever horrendous thing I, I thought I was doing and um, it just stopped me and gave me that perspective it was calming and you know it's you know there's bigger I'm just a tiny part of a, that much bigger thing and I find that really comforting 
Mm -hmm. So, so you said that even as a, as a young mother, that getting out into nature was like a like a something that nourished you. So, what, what do you think it is? I mean, you're always out in nature. You're always camping out in the in the highlands and and seeking mountains and so on. What what does that give you? I I feel I just feel this this sense that like it's like I'm home it's like I have come home when I get to the mountains and get into um, I, I particularly find it in the mountains I don't get this so much in forests or in by the sea or anything like that but actually in the mountains I just feel like I can I guess that I can be myself it's that that really calm feeling inside um things that aren't important a bit like you know getting on on the bike and riding around the world you can't take that extra luggage with you because it's too heavy to carry up the hill and you need to make forward you know pro progress so the mountains are like that for me you leave you like unload all the stuff that you can't carry and then you're just getting to the important you know you're just really getting to the important stuff and it, especially if it's um if you're feeling you know if it's a, if you're climbing a mountain i mean i just like being in them i don't have to go up them but i love climbing them too and you know that feeling that when you're going up them you just everything just comes back to your footsteps and your breath because you're like oh this is really steep and my legs are screaming at me and you know it doesn't matter that you you know that something happened at work or it doesn't matter that you've got lots of things to pay this month or whatever things you might worry about when you're sitting in the house it doesn't matter anymore all you care about is like your new boots are screaming at you and you know you're so out of breath you can't believe it and it just brings it right back to what's important yeah so so that that's like that's like mindfulness just being in the moment and in this moment I'm here and I'm connected and I'm resonating with I'm, I'm in resonance with the, with the living world with the mountains yeah. no? and with my own body no I suppose it is and you know the really funny thing is Davita when somebody says mindfulness I'm like not for me <laughs> meditation no I'm just like got this mental block to those words and yet I love sitting and breathing deeply but don't call it meditation yes, yes <laughs> and yes. i love being at one in nature but don't call it mindfulness yeah. i'm just out of the hill it's really weird isn't it that, yeah. that i'm i am learning that now i'm like that's all that word means is the stuff that you love why are you why are you pushing it away assuming that you can't that it's not for you it's absolutely but, but for me but I kind of also like that you don't want to put those names on it because it's like, uh, this is, we don't need a name for this. This is, this is natural to me. It, I've been doing it always, even since mindfulness was, was uh, a fashionable thing. You know, I go, I always went out in nature and breathed with nature and, and followed my steps of the nature and left my luggage behind and was in the moment. So I kind of actually understand and really respect that, that like, don't call it mindfulness, don't call it meditation, don't put some fancy Eastern uh, label on what I've been doing always. I actually kind of really respect <laughs> that, you know? <laughs> and also it makes it like something pretty matter of fact. It's not something special. Now I am doing mindfulness. It's like I'm doing what a human being naturally does. Yeah. When they're out in the mountain, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And especially when it comes to breathing, and I think sometimes it can. I mean, I find this often that, and I think it can be a barrier, like the language that we use, and you know, we label things because it's easier to explain if you can just say mindfulness then everyone sort of knows what you mean by mindfulness but um so i get why people like need to label things but i do think i do think it can be a barrier to to folk because they've got that's it's that thing that they've got in their minds that that's for other people you know that's like for you know yeah yeah, yeah whereas others. actually whereas actually it's a natural thing to do yeah. for every, every human being and even before we had a word for it we were still doing it <laughs> sometimes <laughs> some more than others <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> yeah so i i am very curious you know is this pushing your own physical limits is that still important for you jenny graham 
Oh, it's it's a real funny one. So after I came back, um, I want to say yes. I want to say yes more than ever, but I'm not, and I, I get such a buzz out of it when I do it, but it's not such a big drive as it was before. You know, I've got a race next year and I've just taken a month off. Like I've just taken a month off training so I can be like, you know, it's been quite a stressful summer, hasn't it? So I'm like, oh, I just need a month to be like, you know, see people and like sit about and eat loads of biscuits and just <laughs> chill and uh, and only do things for fun. And then I'll get back on the training. But I've, um, I, I think, I think I am still using it. I've not got the... Uh, next year will be the first race that I've you know that I'm really really committing to uh, taking part since being around the world and um, so yeah it'll be an interesting process to see it being physical is still really really important to me and having I, I still get such a immense endorphin rush from you know big long days and and exploring places and being with friends and um, but I I think I've I pushed myself so hard to do round the world there's part of me that's a little bit nervous about getting into that again yeah so just for our <laughs> listeners what you're going to do is the transcontinental bike ride that yeah that's is, right so next is that from from belgium to istanbul in turkey yeah so a brest in a brest in france yeah so sort of coast to coast across Europe although next year is you know who, who knows what's going to happen next year with regulations I think the route's going to get changed but it's basically um yeah 5,000 kilometer race across Europe where you've got certain checkpoints that you you know you check into but actually you're solo and self-supported there's yeah, 300 so, riders yeah so you're going to be sleeping uh, how long does that take uh, so you're going to be sleeping three four hours a night right no yeah more. yeah exactly yeah for you know a couple of weeks yeah. yeah I mean if you can get if I could get it under 14 days that would be incredible I'd be so happy <laughs> that. I guess yes I do I pushing myself physically is still really important <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 so uh, b before we end our conversation, Jenny, my podcast, this podcast is called Intimacy with the World. What does that phrase invoke in you? Wow, what a lovely question. Intimacy with the world. I think it's just exactly what we've been talking about, like getting to that you know riding along with the moon cycle being you know climbing that hill or like hearing your own breath and being yeah just sort of just that being for me yeah just that just that being outside for long enough like maybe that's the key there for me that's the um spend it you know you, I get that things when I'm out there for a long time and I'm living out there and it's like day after day it's the living it's the living part of being outside isn't it as like going out on my bike is great and going out for a run is amazing but I, it's a whole new level when you're living outside for a period of time yeah that like that's when the intimacy with the with the actual world really comes into focus that you can yeah. feel it exactly exactly it's so it's so so important and you 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 just can't get away from it you know you're just sitting there's no distractions and you know you're looking up at the moon again or looking at the stars and do you know I have got no idea what the moon phases are what any star is I don't like I have not got an app on my phone I don't care what they're called <laughs> I, 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 I love that. It's like, I don't care if you call it mindfulness or meditation. I just want to be here with my breathing and the mountain and, uh, and the elements. And I don't care if that's called whatever the constellations in the sky are called. They're beautiful. I, I really like that, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Jenny. So I know that you have uh, got a meeting to go to now. So um, Thank you so much for being with me this morning. It's very early in, uh, in Scotland and in Spain. And uh, yeah, Jenny, thank you so much. It's so wonderful to speak to you. It's really inspiring.
Oh, Judy, it's been fantastic speaking to you and what lovely, lovely, lovely set of questions and um, a place to go with it, you know, like just sort of looking beyond the ride and looking at the sort of em emotional journey around it. So, yeah, it's been it's been lovely chatting to you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad. So I really hope you enjoyed this episode with Jenny Graham, the fastest woman to cycle around the world unsupported. And thank you so much for listening to Intimacy with the World podcast with me, Dorita Holm. And be sure to subscribe to the podcast and leave a comment. And if you were with us on YouTube, please like the video and leave a comment. This greatly helps other interested people to find these inspiring conversations. And it also helps me. Thanks again and see you next week.